Um, so, you, you know, one, one thing that I, I like to explain about the cell processor, this idea about leveraging locality uh, really has nothing to do with gaming specifically. Um, it, it, it is, it is a, a broad notion and you can expect that that kind of thing has benefit on a broad set of applications. So, um, you, know, you know, so it's not, it's not just about Linpack and dense matrices. You know, this is nice work by, by Sam Williams that showed that it has benefit on sparse matrices. It has benefit on uh, a, a host of integer workloads. So, you know, things like sorting <coughs> and searching and, and uh, you know, map reuse and this type, type of applications. Um, as well as, of course, the uh, the, the kinds of scientific and uh, uh, image processing, uh, signal processing type workloads that, that people know about. A wide variety of networks. I think recently the uh, the Air Force, you know, put together a fairly large cluster uh, just by by stringing uh, playstations together with uh, with, with the Ethernet. Um, uh, and, and there's other such clusters in, uh, in, in Switzerland and, and other places. Um, I, IBM built a machine. Uh, where we actually, the, the, in the case of Roadrunner, the, the base machine was a was a was an x86 cluster, was using uh, AMD processors, and then the cell uh, processors were attached to that, much the same way that you might attach a graphics card as an accelerator to some of today's uh, supercomputers. And, and the reason for this, again, uh, you know, was was of course the software maturity. Right? We, it, it was still, you know, e even though it. it is a very helpful thing to do from an efficiency point of view. This notion that you that you have to worry worry about locality as a programmer is a is a very big switch. Um, and um, actually, we we have um, built things into the, the software development kit now where it, it turns out that for code we can basically ignore. Um, so so there is a uh, kind of a, a, a clever. Um, uh, JIT type type of mechanism uh, that allows us to uh, you know do away with things like overlays or so on, and so you can pretend that that the code that, that your code space is, is kind of infinitely large, and you can and you can do the the caching of code under the covers. You know, for data, of course, in the general case, we can't do it under the covers because you know they're, they're, we're not fundamentally more clever than people who build conventional microprocessors, right? The, the, the efficiency really does come from the fact that you say what you're going to use before you use it, right? And you, and you allow the processor to go ahead and, so and touch the stuff. Many of those applications are kind of real-time signal processing applications. For example, if you're playing the video on the TV, right. you want a, a, a low latency. Yes. And here, with this block-oriented architecture, you have to move blocks of data to process it itself. So, how do you, well, uh, as a software developer, let's say, right. code, right? how you handle Yes, yeah, so, 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 so actually, the, the, the feedback that I got from sort of the real-time community was that they really liked the cell processor. Mm -hmm. And the reason they really liked it is because things that make programming easier, easy for you on conventional <laughs> multi-core, like caches, you know, and, and, and other uh, speculative structure. You know, if, if you actually have to time out a program and guarantee that you get a certain level of performance every time, you know, you end up in a situation where you have to understand all of that stuff. So in, in the cell processor, there's sort of no magic. You know, so, so the threshold of getting a program to run initially was very high. The threshold of, of optimizing a program compared to, to these other things, especially in, in real-time situations, was, was comparatively low. So, so, you know, rather large upfront investment, but then getting to an optimized result was was so critical. They could understand the, the machine in more of a deterministic way. Yes, yes absolutely. Yes. We, we went to uh, so so I didn't talk a lot here about the SPU, you know, other than, than, than this notion of locality. But um, you know, basically, you know, it, it's. Uh, uh, there are no branch prediction tables and things. There's a branch hint instruction, but again, this is something that you control as a, as a program. Uh, so very, very predictable. Actually, we, we, have a, we have a little utility. You could take a piece of code and just print out, you know, and, and, and you would know how many cycles it, it would take. You know, we're sort of indented by the different instructions. So 
so very, very, very easy uh, schedule. You still have only one external memory for it, right? It, it was it was physically actually two independent memory ports that we introduced. Yeah, it looks like one. But it seems like all you've done is move your bandwidth bottleneck from between the multiple processors to the outside. Now you've got all those uh, SPUs trying to contend for the same thing. Well, they mainly have to load it once, but they still got to get it. Yes. So I, I think so. So certainly. The fact that you need that you have, that you have more mem pressurable memory bandwidth with multi-core is is true of cell as much as anything else. The, the only the only place where where cell actually does help is because we operate in a in a non-speculative manner typically. Right? It, 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 the stuff that we that we get from memory is typically the stuff that we need. Now we we did you know of course we were worried about this in in the case of cell. I described the local stores to you as, as private memories. Now, in fact, we did map them into the memory map of the entire machine. And the reason we mapped them into the, into the global memory map was to allow a DMA into or out of a local store to target another local store. And, and we, we thought, and, and we provided almost an order of magnitude more bandwidth within the chip, you know, between the local stores. Of course, we could do that because it's much easier to provide bandwidth within the chip than off to, to memory. Um, you know, so we thought, okay, for an order of magnitude more, more bandwidth, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's perhaps worth it to, to do this. However, I would guess that for anything that's uh, so, some sort of uh, Serial processing on, on a lot of data, like it gives right, you. Right, right, right. So, so, uh, so as audio, you can right. uh, move those uh, buffers from one right, processor right. to the other. Yeah, exactly. like so, 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 you know, for example, and, and, and it may not be a very good example, but, but the, the first versions of H.264 that we had, you know, would, would take data and, you know, just roughly three phases and they would use a different SPE for, for each phase. The, the experience that, that we that, that programmers had by and large was that it was very difficult to maintain code in that way. And almost, I think more than 95% of the applications on cell went back to this model of you know, having data in shared memory, processing it on an SPE and putting it back into shared memory. Now, now that doesn't, you, you, you'll, you'll have to, you know, one reason architecture is very hard is that, that you have to, think five years ahead and 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 you know people come up with incredibly clever things right so 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 I'm, I'm still not quite sure if 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 so 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 just an example um, um, Jesus Labarta in in uh, at, at uh, Polytechnic University in, in, uh, in Catalonia in Barcelona and, and colleagues you know they have a, a model where it's sort of a task-based model. And, and, and we know that many applications that really scale well are actually task-based. You, you can have this abstraction of having all tasks, you know, sort of out there in shared memory, but then in the execution, if you have a task graph, you know, you know how things are going to, to get executed, you may be able to, to know that the, uh, you know, that, that one task produces a result that is going to get picked up by another one. And even though you haven't programmed it with that way, your, your implementation, your runtime, might be able to take the result of that first task and ship it directly over to another SPE that is going to consume that data and do the next stage with it. Right. So I, I am, you know, I, ha I have become convinced that it's, you know, we're, we're not nearly at the stage where uh, programmers are so desperate for performance that they're willing to go to these very explicit uh, uses of locality. On the on the other hand, you know, there may be ways to, well, to sort of deal with it. Libraries should do that, right? That's that's where you need to have libraries to Absolutely. That for you. I mean, Li libraries, of course, is another way. Yes, I mean. Because and, and I, I mean, I don't think you can expect domain experts to program like that, but you do expect the domain architect to call libraries, right? Right, but even and and you know, in, in the case of cell, we did in fact invest very large amounts of money in. In, in getting a number of libraries written, uh, it, it is much more expensive than, than most people assume.
to, to enable an architecture that is a, that is a compliant set of libraries. Well, I think that's where the real cost is, what my argument is, because if you don't have good libraries, you're not going to get people to use it. That's right, but, but, but so, kind of being so the, the argument, I guess my point is that the, the argument that holds for programmers at large pretty closely also holds even for library writers. Right. Because you, 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 one, one might think that you know library writers would have a much higher tolerance, you know, for programming complexity than, than the programming community at large. It actually turns out that you have to get so many libraries written that that, that the same problem might actually kind of yeah, you have a shortage of library writers or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, let me see how we are doing time. Okay, we're doing okay. <laughs> Um, so, so another machine that uh, you know, I, I showed you this uh, this, this power. Uh, it's actually a slice of the the, the blue water machine, uh, the power seven with, with water cooling. Uh, there was also a, a, a very interesting machine built with uh, with cell uh, that leverages uh, two 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 interesting pieces of technology. One of them is that instead of a sort of a typical architecture where you have the processor and then you have some kind of a bridge chip and then you have network chips, this one had the, the, the cell processor you know, and the memory around it and then uh, an FPGA, which was uh, you know, directly implemented the, the switching function uh, for, in this case, a, 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 a supercomputer that was targeted mostly at quantum chromodynamics. It's not a, it's not a single purpose machine. Uh, but in quantum chromodynamics, you're very interested in getting very low latency messaging, and uh, you know they were able to implement it with these uh, with these FPGAs. The only other thing that's interesting about this machine is that it has an, an architecture where um, you know o only the the mid planes here is where is where water runs through. So you know it's kind of like the back of your fridge, where actually you have say water running through this table. And then these things got a metal cover and then got clamped onto the mid plane right? and, in, and into the electrical thing at the, at the back. So it gives you a very serviceable uh, architecture, uh, even though it's, uh, it's using water. And, and that, that had another, uh, you know, that had an interesting benefit. If you looked at the, uh, at the Green 500 list uh, for, from, I guess, for maybe three iterations or so from, from when this machine came out until. Uh, until the one in June. Um, so, so here there's uh, you know, 773 mega, uh, megaclocks per watt, whereas the conventional cell machines uh, were, were in, the, in, the, in the 400s. And, and, and a lot of that came from, from this different, uh, different cooling solution. It was not the, the only factor, but, but it was a significant factor. So you can see that this kind of engineering you know, of, of how you go from the processor to a system uh, also has a very significant uh, impact. Now, oops. now, of course, in the, the most recent list, uh, you know, these, these things are still on there, which is kind of remarkable. Keep in mind, this is 65 nanometer technology, you know, competing with, uh, with, with, with 32 uh, uh, nanometer technology. And I guess this one is uh, 45 nanometer, I believe. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's done quite well. Um, you know what this list does show is that b both of these ideas, right, uh, heterogene, heterogeneous, heterogeneous computing, as well as as uh, going to many small cores, uh, are ways to get to uh, to efficiency. The uh, the blue gene uh, machine basically uses very large number of very small cores, which is a more problematic route for the community at large to to follow. Of the, the, the work and applications that it uh, implies, uh, but but this, uh, it, it certainly gives you uh, efficiency as well. Okay, and, and here's a little bit more on uh, on, on, on blue gene. It's the, the way I like to think about blue gene. Uh, so this is the, the 